In this tutorial, I talk about two main concepts, macros and metaprogramming. If you have watched my Julia Programming for Beginners playlist, you know that we have talked about macros several times, but we haven't discussed the very nature of them. But before that, I have to give you the definition of metaprogramming. What is metaprogramming? Metaprogramming is when you write Julia code to process and modify Julia code. With the metaprogramming tools, you can write Julia code that modifies other parts of your source files and control under what condition and when the modified code runs. The execution of raw source code in Julia programming language takes place in several stages. But for the simplicity, in this tutorial, we consider two stages. The first stage is when your raw Julia code is paused. I mean, convert it into a form that is suitable for evaluation. This is actually the phase when all your syntax mistakes are noticed. The result of this stage is an abstract syntax tree or AST for short. Stage 2 is when that paused code is executed. When you run a Julia code in the repo or from the command line, you don't notice the two stages because they happen so quickly. However, here's the important part. With Julia's metaprogramming facilities, you can access the code after it has been paused but before it's evaluated. This lets you do things that you can't normally do. For example, you can convert simple expressions to more complicated expressions, or examine code before it runs and change it so that it runs faster. Any code that you intercept and modify using these metaprogramming tools will eventually be evaluated in the usual way, running as fast as ordinary Julia code. One example of metaprogramming is the time macro that we have already used in our course. The add time macro inserts a start a stopwatch command at the beginning of the code and add some code at the end to stop the stopwatch and calculate the elapsed time and memory usage. The modified code is then passed on for evaluation. Another one is the at which macro. The macro does not allow the expression 2 plus 2 to be evaluated at all. Instead, it reports which method would be used for these particular arguments and it also tells you the source file that contains the method's definition and the line number. Now I want to talk about the quoted expressions. For metaprogramming to be possible, there has to be a way for Julia to store an unevaluated but paused expression as soon as the pausing phase has finished. This is the colon prefix operator. To Julia, the colon x is an unevaluated or quoted symbol. Here I assign the value 3 to the variable x, but the colon x returned the x symbol. To quote whole expressions rather than individual symbols, start with the colon and then enclose the Julia expressions in parentheses. There is an alternative form of the colon opening and closing parentheses construction that uses the quote and keywords to enclose and quote an expression. Here I assign value returned by quoting for loop to the expression variable. The expression object is of type expr. As you can see, it's paused and it's ready to go. Now the question is how do we evaluate the expressions? We can use the eval function for evaluating an unevaluated expression. For instance, we can use Julia's eval function and pass the colon x to it. Basically, we can pass any quoted expression to the eval function and it will be evaluated. With these tools, it's possible to create any expression and store it without having it evaluate. More usefully, it's possible to modify the contents of the expression before it's evaluated. As I said, we can modify an unevaluated expression. Consider the value assigned to the variable p. Notice the helpful line numbers that have been added to each line of the quoted expression. The labels for each line are added on the end of the previous line. We can use the field names function to see what's inside this expression. The head field is column block. The args field is an array containing expressions including comments. We can examine these with the usual Julia techniques. For example, what's the second sub-expression? And print them out. As you can see, the expression p contains a number of sub-expressions. We can modify this expression quite easily. For example, we can change the last line of the expression to use prod function rather than sum function, so that when p is evaluated, it will return the product rather than the sum of the variables. Alternatively, you can target the sum function directly by borrowing into the expression. Once the code has been paused, we have the abstract syntax tree. It's a nested hierarchical structure that's designed to allow both you and Julia to easily process and modify the code. The dump function lets you easily visualize the hierarchical nature of an expression. For example, the expression colon three times sine of pi over 2 is represented like this. You can see that the AST consists entirely of expressions or EXPRs and atoms, for example, symbols and numbers. In a way, a strings and expressions are similar. Any Julia code they happen to contain is usually unevaluated, but you can have some of the code evaluated using interpolation. 
I've already talked about how to use a string interpolation operator in the Julia programming for beginners playlist. Indeed, the dollar sign when used inside a string and possibly with parentheses to enclose the expression, this evaluates the Julia code and inserts the resulting value into the string at that point. For example, the sign of 1 is dollar sign sign of 1. The dollar sign sign of 1 will be evaluated to its value. In just the same way, you can use the dollar sign to include the results of executing Julia code interpolated into an expression which is otherwise unevaluated. For example, code s is equal to dollar sign sign of 1 plus cosine of 1 and be ended with the end keyword. Even though this is a quoted expression and hence unevaluated, the value of sine of 1 plus cosine of 1 was calculated and inserted into the expression, replacing the original code. This operation is called a splicing. Once you know how to create and handle unevaluated Julia expressions, you'll want to know how you can modify them. A macro is a way of generating a new output expression given an unevaluated input expression. When your Julia program runs, it first pauses and evaluates the macros and the processed code code produced by the macro is eventually evaluated like an ordinary expression. Here's the definition of a simple macro that prints out the contents of the thing you pass to it, and then returns the expression to the calling environment, here the repo. The syntax is very similar to the way you define functions. You run the macros by preceding the name with the at sign prefix. This macro is expecting a single argument. You are providing unevaluated Julia code. You don't have to enclose it with parentheses like you do for function arguments. First, Let's call this with a single numeric argument, for instance, add p and pass the number 3. Since numbers are not expressions, the if condition inside the macro didn't apply. All the macro did was return n, which is the number 3. But if you pass an expression, the code in the macro has the opportunity to inspect and process the expression's content before it's evaluated using the .args field. There is an eval function and an at eval macro. You might be wondering what's the difference between the two. The function version eval expands the expression and evaluates it. The macro version does not expand the expression you supply to it automatically, but you can use the interpolation syntax to evaluate the expression and pass it to the macro. Here is an example where you might want to create some variables using some automation. We'll create the first 10 squares and 10 cubes, first using eval function, which creates a load of variables named var underline squares underline n, which n iterates through 1 to 10. Alternatively, we can use the at eval macro, which similarly creates a load of variables named var underline cubes underline n. You might want to use a one-liner once you feel confident, which basically does the same thing as the code above. When you use macros, you have to keep an eye out for scoping issues. In the previous example, the dollar sign ESC passing the variable EX to it syntax was used to prevent the expression from being evaluated in the wrong context. Here is another contrived example to illustrate this point. This macro declares a variable S and returns a coded expression containing S and an escaped version of S. When we run the macro and pass the value to, you can see that the macro returned different values for the symbol S. The first was the value value inside the macros context for the second was an escape version of s that was evaluated in the calling context where s has the value 0 in a sense esc function has protected the value of s as it passes unharmed through the macro to see what the macro expands to just before it's finally executed we use the macro expand function it expects a coded expression containing one or more macro calls which are then expanded into proper julia code for you so that you can see what the macro would do when called here i've written another macro do times which adds do times construction to the language, which can be used like this. If you use the macro expand function on this, you can see what happens to the symbol names. I constantly make Julia programming tutorials. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel to not lose the future content. Also, don't forget to look at the playlists on my channel. You can find the link to them in the video description.